Hello again. Here we are at New England Conservatory in Jordan Hall for the last concert of the fall season. At the opening concert in October, I mentioned that because of the pandemic, we lost two Beethoven programs, April and May. We, we, there was nothing happening here. Everything was shut down. And there was so many interesting performances that had been arranged that somehow or other I was determined that this fall I would rescue as much of it as I could to bring us what we would have listened to last spring. So what we've got tonight, I'm going to talk about the pieces one at a time, but what we've got tonight is a piece by Beethoven. Um, it was originally meant to be his C major quintet, Opus 29. Now it's a different one, but it's for the same combination. And uh, it was further complicated in trying to get that together because last spring it was going to be played by the Verona Quartet, a wonderful group in residence then at New England Conservatory. Uh, they left this fall, they began a residency at Oberlin College and further had the complication that their cellist, Jonathan Dormand, couldn't get back in time to play in this piece because he's British and he was stuck in the UK for visa reasons. So at that point, you know, we have a wonderful president, Andrea Kalin, and the job before she came here was as the dean of the conservatory at Oberlin. So we talked, and she got on the phone, and we put it all together. So what we've got now, playing this quintet, and then I'll tell you about the piece, are three members from the Verona Quartet minus the cellist. So we needed a cellist and we needed a second violist. So we got Derrett Atkins, who's on the faculty there to play cello, and Kirsten Doctor, who was a viola faculty there. And they are actually, they've actually recorded it and sent it to us from Oberlin as a video presentation. So that's what we're going to see tonight. But I want to tell you about the piece because it's really interesting. This is a piece I have to confess to you I didn't know about. But they were big, very big on doing and then I figured out what was going on and I'm really excited about it. Beethoven was born in 1870. I mean, all of this celebration now is because of the 250th anniversary of his birth, 2020. He was from Bonn, Germany, and he wanted to come to Vienna to study with Mozart. He came when he was 17 years old. Probably he played for Mozart. We don't have absolute proof. Probably he heard him play but he had to go back home again for family reasons. And when he was able finally to come, sadly, Mozart had died at a very young age. So he came and he studied with Haydn, Franz Josef Haydn, greatest, most famous composer in the world at that time, except for Mozart, you know, the two of them were, were it. And his Opus 1, which he finally thought was good enough to put an Opus number to, were three trios for piano, violin, and cello. And they're called Opus 1, number 1, 2, and 3. And Haydn was impressed, this was his student, but he said to Beethoven, you know, I wouldn't publish the third one because I think the Viennese people won't understand it. Beethoven was really upset at that because he thought that was the best one. Anyway, it became very popular, Opus 1. It's in C minor, and it's a remarkable piece. And much later, in a period when he was not writing much music, not long after the great Archduke Trio, which we heard in October, he was having family problems with his nephew and this and that, and he was kind of, you know, any artist, they have ups and downs. And Somebody came to him, a Herr Kaufmann, with a, um, uh, an arrangement 
of his Opus 1, number 3, for two viola quintet. He looked at it. He said, oh, well, there are a few things that are good, but mostly it's a pretty bad arrangement. That always got him going, you know. He was proud of what he could do. So he went to work on it, and he completely redid it. And he was so happy with what he did that it got published as Opus 104. So now Opus 1 number 3 became Opus 104. And that year was 1818. And um, he allowed it to be published by his publishing house, Artaria. And then um, he wrote, this is what he had to say about what he got and what he did. A three-voice quintet raised from the greatest wretchedness to some respectability, sacrificing the original as a solemn burnt offering to the gods of the underworld. He had his own very strange sense of humor. Anyway, what we're going to hear now is Opus 1, number 3, also now known as the Two Viola Quintet, Opus 1, O four in C minor by Beethoven, played by our friends at Oberlin. Let's listen.
The middle piece on our program tonight is not by Beethoven, but it's something that I really wanted to share with you. Beethoven lived most of his life in Vienna, but he was born in Bonn, Germany. Not far away from Bonn, Germany is Frankfurt. In Frankfurt, in, 18, in 1749, was born Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who was considered the greatest writer and just about everything except composer of his time, not only in Germany but in Europe. He was, he was the top of the heap. And what I found as I was reading was that they knew of one another for a long time and admired one another, but until a certain moment had never met. And what we're coming to now is a collection of songs based upon poetry of Goethe. But the thing I wanted to do is there is a supremely great composer, younger than Beethoven, 
1797. You know who it is. It's Franz Schubert, born in Vienna when Beethoven was there already, lived in Vienna. They never met. Kind of startling until you think that Schubert was kind of shy and Beethoven was deaf and not really very good mixing with people. Well, but they both know, knew about Goethe. I think Beethoven did write some things by Goethe, set some things. But you know, Schubert was this amazing composer for all kinds of music, but he's, among other things, extremely famous for having written hundreds of songs, which we call Lieder. It's the German word that just means songs. And he wrote his first one when he was 17 years old, based upon a character in Goethe's Faust, Gretchen who falls in love with Faust. He's a 17-year-old young composer, still is considered one of the greatest songs in our history. And it went on and on. And he wrote about 80 songs to texts of Goethe. So how does this fit together? Well, there is somebody else involved. This is a young woman named Bettina von Arnim, who was 15 years younger than Beethoven. She came from a very, very interesting family. Her brother was the poet Clemens Brentano, and she married a man named Achim von Arnim. And Achim von Arnim and Clemens Brentano went to work and put together a huge collection of folk songs from Germany known as Des Knaben Wunderhorn, the boy's magic horn which influenced composers all the way into the 20th century. I think mostly about Mahler, but it was very broadly used. Anyway, she was what I call a very interesting young woman. She was captivated by Goethe. And I read that she went to visit him, and before he knew what was happening, she jumped up and was sitting in his lap. She was, I think, 17 years old. <laughs> okay, it's quite a picture. But in any case, uh, nothing, as they say, came of that. And then a few years later, she met Beethoven, and one wondered whether um, there was always something lurking in the background with Beethoven, the eternal beloved. Was she it? And most everybody says no, but it turned out that it probably was her sister-in-law who was married to a Brentano, Amelie Brentano. And, um, but in any case, uh, Anthony Fin, uh, Brentano, excuse me, I said that wrong. But in any case, she decided that it was important for Beethoven and Goethe to meet. And at that point, Goethe was, uh, Beethoven was being told by his doctors, you know, there's no cure, but maybe if you go to one of those spas and lie in the waters, you'll feel better. So he went to a place very famous as a spa, a spa called Teplitz, where he stayed for a month or two. And while he was there, Goethe was there. And they met. And they talked. And then they parted. There's stories that they were walking in the woods when the royal, the empress's procession came by, and Beethoven kept walking forward and didn't pay any attention. And Goethe bowed down because he was noble. Probably didn't happen, but it, Stories are good sometimes. In any case, they did meet, and they exchanged lots of letters after that, full of praise for one another, but never quite lacking in suspicion of the other. One an aristocrat, one a revolutionary. Anyway, to help us understand Beethoven, we're now going to listen to songs both by Bettina von Arnim and Franz Schubert, all of them with texts by Goethe. Let's listen. Thank you. 
The last piece on this program and the last piece of our fall season is one of the supreme masterpieces of any composer. 
It's the quartet in A minor, opus 132, written by Beethoven in his late period when he came back to composing. After composing the Ninth Symphony and the Missa Solemnis, he was very, very full of music. And of course, he was completely deaf. And he was approached by a Russian nobleman, Count Nikolai Galitsyn, asking him to write some string quartets. And he took the offer seriously. So three of them are dedicated to Galitsyn, Opus 127, Opus 130, excuse me, and 131 and 132. Okay, so what's interesting, this is, I have just two things to tell you about this piece. It's so well known and we're going to hear a wonderful performance tonight by the Parker Quartet. Um, two things to tell you about it. Somehow or other, Beethoven got stuck on a four-note, a four, four-note group. Like later, you know, Arnold Schoenberg was writing 12 tone. Well, Beethoven had four. And I'll just sing the first four notes. I may not have the right key, but anyway, you'll get it. Two half tones separated by an interval. Well, it turned out he was so interested in that four notes that he not only wrote Opus 132 based on those four notes, but Opus 131, which starts as a fugue with a transposition of those four notes, and Opus 130. And Opus 130 ends with a great fugue called the Grosse Fouille, which everybody said, oh, to make the piece too big, Ludwig, you've got to put another ending to it, which he did. Now mostly quartets play it as the last movement of Opus 130. And it's the same da 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 The only one more thing I have to tell you and then we'll go in for the music. Just before writing this piece, Beethoven had terrible stomach disorder and he thought that was it, he thought he was going to die. And in the middle of this piece, he wrote a movement that is still considered one of the supreme moments in our history, in which he titled it Heiliger Dankgesang eines Gesehenen an die Gottheit in der Lyrischen Tonart. That means holy song of thanksgiving of a convalescent to the deity in the Lydian mode. Lydian mode is like if you're sitting at a piano and you start on F and you play all the white keys, there is an extra funny note in the middle of that. That's the Lydian mode going back to Greek times. And in the middle of that piece, of that movement, which is quite long, he goes back and forth from very, very intricate counterpoint. Which comes three times, each time a little bit more complicated. And then it's always interrupted by something that he titles Neue Kraft fühlen, feeling new strength. Okay, uh, my voice is not going to take the evening. But anyway, it's enough to get us involved and we're ready for that performance now. So sit back. It's a long song worth every minute.
So somehow or other, we've made it through a fall season of First Monday. Three concerts done, new mode, all pre-recorded. For the most part, I think all of them, you can watch again and again. They'll be on the website, the, the YouTube of NEC. And great performances. What talented people we have here playing. Wonderful colleagues, wonderful friends. And the last thing to say is that we have a fantastic team of people here who have made this happen. Everything from stage people to video people to audio people to management to our president. It's been a real pleasure to work with all of them. And now as we're approaching holiday time, I wish you all great holidays and listen to the music over and over. Thanks very much.